I am calling to order the Finance and Audit Committee meeting um, Tuesday, May 4th at 3.04. Um, and I'll read the statement of announcement. A meeting notice announcing the time, date, and place of the May 4th, 2021 Finance and Audit Committee meeting was distributed on April 30th, 2021 to appropriate media and other groups or individuals who have requested notification. The announcement and agenda were posted at the Department of Disabilities and Special Needs Administrative Office and on the website. The public has been notified that accommodations such as interpreters, mobility assistance, or other assistance will be provided to individuals with disabilities and special needs if requested in advance. Um, all right, so the um, next item is the adoption of the agenda. Um, can I get a motion to ad adopt the agenda? As written? So moved. so moved. Okay. Barry, you second it? Second, yeah. Uh, agenda is approved as written. Um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes for, from April 6, 2021 Finance and Audit Committee meeting. Can I get a motion to approve the, um, the minutes as written? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, any, um, okay, so minutes are approved as, um, as written. Um, the first item on the um, agenda for Pat um, is um, directed 275-04-DD, um, Procedures for Implementation of DDSN Audit Policy for DSN Boards. Pat? Okay, thank you. Um, these two policies have been uh, edited by finance staff and gone through uh, the policy committee and now they are on the finance committee and audit to address. Um, uh, the, the, there's two directives. They say the same thing. One auditing boards, one auditing private providers, and there's some small differences between the two. If you look at the changes in the two audit directives, um, the, the biggest difference I saw was uh, standardizing the sample size for the uh, uh, the ROAP portion of the financial audit, requiring the CPA to test a 10% sample on each service line for uh, appropriate Medicaid billing. Um, that's a, I think that's a substantial change from the prior audit, which was pretty much generic, letting it you know basically letting the CPA uh, used professional standards to develop their sample size. Uh, according to internal audit, um, the sample sizes were too small. They were, they were not sufficient. And therefore, based on internal audit input, they recommended that we go to a 10% sample, um, which, which, is a big, which is a big increase. Um, so I do expect us to get comments on that from the provider and audit community when we vet it. Our goal is to um, hopefully you will approve them today and we will we will vet them uh, uh, tonight or tomorrow morning for 10 days. Um, and depending on the feedback we get, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if, if it's nominal, we may want to ask permission to try to take it to the commission to get it approved because we're entering auditing season. Most of our boards and, and providers have a fiscal year end of June 30th. They're doing preparation. And they always like to be up on the latest uh, uh, any adjustments to the audit program. When they see the tent, when they when they see it vetted for ten days, they will understand the recommended changes. Um, if we can't get it to the May uh, commission meeting because the, the feedback is too complicated or too voluminous, uh, we certainly will do it in June. Uh, but I just want to hopefully leave that door open. If it is de minimis, that we can possibly consider going right to the commission uh, on May twentieth. Um, but uh, with that said, I recommend that we um, move these two directives uh, uh, for public vetting. Okay. Let me let me ask first about this. Um, I, the fines don't seem to be high enough for me for people that do not for people that do not comply. It it ends at I think it's twenty five hundred dollars. And it's a hundred dollars a day. 
I think it should be more per day, but even if, it, even if it's not more per day, it certainly should be a maximum of more than $2,500. Um, because with all the money that, that providers have in reserve, they're not overly concerned about $2,500, I wouldn't think. And so I would think we need to double that to 5,000 could be the maximum they could be charged. What um, what page are you on, Barry? 12. 12, okay. Um, I believe it's the board one, but I think it should be for both. But I mean, I believe the one I saw is on, on number 12. I mean, it's, it's on page 12 of the board one, which is the first one we had. Right, so so Pat, the um, the this directive hasn't been updated since 1990, 98 or 88? Um, 88 is what, what it says on page one. I, I would have to double check that. I you know I think when they edit this and put in those numbers, the, the, where it says last reviewed, last revision date, I think um, they eliminate that information. So I don't think that information is on this document. I think the 88 is the date of issuance, the original issuance. Okay. okay. I wish I could answer that, but I, I can't. Okay. Okay. Just trying to. Um, actually, per oh, report, right? It says the maximum uh, that's uh, per report. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, th this has been updated in the last four or five years. I'm, I feel certain because the fines is a relatively new concept. Okay, it has been updated, but it's just that the fine to me the fines are not high enough, and and particularly the amount of money you can be charged is not high enough. Not, I mean, I guess one hundred dollars a day is okay, but twenty five hundred dollars is not enough. They could maximally be charged. I mean, some of them truly would ignore the twenty five hundred dollar thing and just say, well, I'll just pay that, and I'll well, just get it done when I want to. And we shouldn't allow that. My question is, how often are um, are they late year up, you know, year over year? What's the percentage? Is it ten percent? Um, I, I, I would late? guess. I'm, I was hoping maybe there might be an audit person in here. Um, <laughs> you're the best we got right now. <laughs> I, I can tell you without being certain of the information. I see copies when internal audit finds somebody, and I might see five or six a year of, of late, late fees. Okay. There's generally a so, so mm -hmm. it's not it's not a lot, right? I mean, five or six is not twenty five. Exactly. And when they're late, how late are they typically? Do you say a month, two, six months? Like what? Um, again, internal audit would be, would answer that. Um, my my recollection of looking at the traffic I see is if somebody's going to be late a month or so, they call. If they call and give us notice, I think we we generally give them exceptions. It's when they're kind of like non-responsive that we that Kevin would start doing the fines. And I think the people that get the fines may be repeat offenders. Uh, um, for for a number of reasons. So I, I don't think it's a large number. Um, I think we give them plenty of extensions if they if they call in advance. The purpose of the fine that I understand is we, we weren't even they weren't even calling asking for extensions and they're non-responsive. So that's why that came into being. And I think it did help some, but maybe hadn't helped all the way because we still have a small number that do get fined. Okay, and you're saying that the money on this directive is what they're accustomed to. It's it's been in place for a number of years. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I, I would just offer one point of view, which is, uh, I, I agree with Commissioner Malfres that you know look, a deadline's a deadline. There's no reason you know if you can call, we cooperate with anybody. But if you're non-responsive, we can have a fine. I would I would say maybe this may not be the year to do it only because uh, you know providers are are, are are turning in you know their row apps and financial statements on certain deadlines and because we've been so far behind in our provider cost reports I feel a little guilty about finding them for being late now we do use them for room and board calculations and other things um, I, I think you know. <coughs> I think if internal audit room, they could answer that question with a lot more specificity. Um, 
I I don't know if it certainly wouldn't wouldn't hurt to raise it. Uh, I just don't know if uh, you know well, the timing is right given the COVID world and and there are some there are some pain points out there for the provider network. Right. Um, well, I mean, we can be as lenient as we want to be. The point is, you want to be able to do it whenever you don't want to be lenient anymore. I mean, that's mm -hmm. my point. Yeah. You, you could always waive it if you wanted to. I mean, if you came to the board and said it's supposed to be a five thousand dollar fee, but we're going to waive it to two thousand because because of some extenuating circumstance, then we could all we could always waive it. But if we don't have it in there, we can't waive it. It's like a late fee for a rent on a house. I can waive a late fee all day long. But if I don't have it in there to, to, to where I can charge it, and I can never charge it even if I want to. So that's what all I'm saying. We can waive it if we want to as a commission or even as a finance committee or whatever. But when you don't have it in there, you don't have it in there. So, um, Pat, what was the reason for bringing the, um, this policy again today to the commission? Was there a time sensitivity to this? I know you just said that it's audit season. That's... Uh I, I I I believe that it was brought because there I don't I don't believe it was necessarily a four year cycle routine. I think it was brought because they wanted to make that particular adjustment to the row app because they were not getting the responses that they felt were appropriate and they wanted to increase the sample size. Uh, I would have to double check to whether it was brought specifically by former uh, CFO Clark or whether it was just on the four year cycle. Okay. Um, and I have another issue, but I'm trying to get through this one first. Yeah. But I, I mean, you know, it's not, a, I mean, it's not, I'm not going to jump up and down and, and have a stroke or anything. I'm just saying it just doesn't make it, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me as to why you don't put a higher fine in there than you ever want to charge somebody. And then when you, if you ever want to, you can, because if people are just blowing us off, we shouldn't allow it. And and the only way to not not allow them to do that is to is to put the fines as high as, as we want to put them, and then decide what we want to do. Yeah. Um. What's your other your other question, Barry, on this? My other question is what is what um what is um Pat's position on mandatory audit rotation because I think that would be that would also cover this particular I think that would cover this too and it, and it doesn't I don't think it says anything about it I didn't get enough time to read this like I wanted to in detail but I don't think it says anything about mandatory audit rotation and I just want to see where we were on that I, I think that was uh, oh man I'm getting, I got some backup from internal audit um, it was really if, I, I, I read them again is, is mandatory rotation in there I don't think it is. No. I think it was discussed at previous meetings and it was decided before I got involved not to do it. My, my view on on mandatory rotations is I think it is a, it is a good thing, but it would have to be implemented over like uh, a, a you'd have to give them multiple years heads up because so many of the providers have the same auditor for multiple years and when they do rotate, which would be healthy, you would have an increase in cost because of the uh, the new auditor has to get has to become familiar with the uh, particular enterprise. Um, so I, I think it I, I would be generally for it. It's not in this particular uh, document, and I guess I I'm kind of in the second third quarter of this document. Um, maybe uh, you can share the light. Did that come up? Rotating auditors as well as the frequency. I think we can talk about that. So yes, sir. We've talked about it over and over when it, with our former um, CFO, but we never decided what we were going to do for 100%. And I just, I've just always thought it was a very, from my years on a particular county board, I, I just cannot tell you how important it would have been for us as a county to do that. And I, I'll admit I could not get the rest of the board to do it because the, because the executive director did not want to do it. But there was no good reason why the executive director didn't want to do it. Um, it wasn't cost at that time, and and I know it costs a little bit more money, but I, I mean, anyway, that's just well, another big issue of mine. My recollection of the discussion uh, regarding um, auditor rotation was it was a very complicated, it was not a very straightforward issue. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges that come along with 
with it. And that's why we haven't made a decision on it yet because there, it's complex in terms of, um, you know, Pat's, you know, brought up a few things today about it. Um, so, you know, it's something that we do need to deal with at some point, not today. Um, but um, it's definitely uh, something that that we, we, we do need to, to figure out. Um, I, um, I'm lean, I definitely lean towards maybe a rotation um, of the boards, you know, um, getting different years for the, the requirement so that, um, you know, we can kind of, um, you know, deal with the, 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 the actual CPAs in our state that want to do this kind of work. So I just think it's, it's, um, it's complicated, and, which is why we haven't addressed it yet. Um, it was, you know, put off to the side because of all the other things we were dealing with. And so we can definitely put it back on the agenda. And, um, you know, there's several documents out there, pros and cons of the auditor rotation issue and what it, the challenges that it poses, the benefits that it, that it brings. I mean, it's, um, yeah. Um, so for today and in, in this directive, um, does um i think i think i think i heard um mr nan is it nanny it's voice hey, yes. yeah okay um i think my questions earlier to in, in this call what was um do um how how many boards and providers i guess don't um don't meet the deadline every year that we already have in place what's the number of of you know is it so far this year we have uh one, two, three, six total so far okay we split boards and providers mostly boards okay the total is ninety six hundred dollars so far i still have one at least one more i know i need to send a letter for which would be mm -hmm. about twenty five hundred dollars which will bring that total to two thousand one hundred dollars yeah that's for FY 2020. For FY 2019, there's at least uh, at least 10. And that total we collected for FY 19 was $19,100. Okay. Total of and how many of those people are perpetually late every year? And there are some. The requirements were additional this year because of the change we made last year. Uh, cause uh, some boards to be late because their financial person is doing the books uh, was having issues with staff turnover and that kind of thing. Uh, cause them to be late, but the RP are consistent, but not a, a whole lot. Right, well, I, I, I'm not suggesting there's a lot of them. What I'm suggesting is the only way to get those to do something is to change that time. But. 40 for the boards, just about maybe 10 for the providers. Six out of 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they the same or are they different? Yeah. Are they the same or are they different? I'm sorry, Ms. Miller. Are they the same ones or are they different? There are some repeat providers. And that's six that we are talking about now. Six. Uh, let's see. At least two of them, I can tell for sure. Hey, I'm this not, is I'm kind of scanning it. This is Commissioner Rollins, and how are y'all? Great, hey Stephanie. Um, hey. Could we not build in possibly, Robin, look at in the future? If not now, looking at the future, the first time the fee would be twenty five hundred dollars. The second time it happens to the same board. The yeah. fee goes up to five thousand. I think there needs to be an increase so that they know it's not just going to be twenty five hundred dollars every year. Well, it says the 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 thing says a hundred dollars a day. Yeah, I mean, so, but, it's, but it maxes out at twenty five hundred. Yeah, and I think that they need to understand that the second time they do it, it's two hundred dollars a day. You see what I'm saying? I think that would well, be that changes the entire form because that would be more discouraging of them for doing that than than just you know changing the whole rate system 
Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, you mind if I add something? Yeah, sure. I'm just, yeah. That was, I just threw that idea out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the proposal for this coming year is 25 murders per report. That's if the reaper proceed report is late, that's a maximum up to a maximum of twenty-five hundred dollars. If the financial statements are late, that's up to a maximum of twenty five hundred dollars. If we was request a credit action plan for either the financial statements or the reaper procedures, that's another up to twenty five hundred dollars. So there is a potential that the board or provider could have actually up to seventy five hundred dollars in assessments. And it does state that it says per yes. report. Per report and, and part of the and part of the CAF for credit match plan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. Just move on. Well, yeah, I, not, I I um I personally think that maybe we should add into that paragraph um something about the consecutive violations year over year per Stephanie's suggestion is it would it would double. So um, that's what I, I think we should try to work into. So then you're saying it'd be $200 a day if, if you did uh, it last year and this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not really sure how we would word that in this document, but it would be um, um, maybe s s something um, as simple as um, um, adding a sentence that says um, if if violations occur the following year by the same provider that these charges will double. Well, that, would be, that would be called consecutive years. If you do it in consecutive years yeah. with the same provider, then 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 ever then the fees on this this page would double. Yeah. So in other words, it would be two hundred dollars a day and up to five thousand dollars for that person per report. Yeah. That's that's, that's fine. With me. That's better than we have, so that's better for me. Right. That's what I suggest. Um, Pat, any any thoughts on that? Or I think that's very. I think it's very simple, and it's very focused on repeat offenders. And I think you're targeting your efforts on on people that probably need to be targeted. So I think yeah. that's not okay. a, that's not a it's, a, it's an easy fix, and uh, we okay. amp up the the, the the incentive. Okay. Okay. Well, then I'll then I'll make a motion that we do that with um with the, with the with the change and we can and you can bring the change with us to the um commission meeting and we can uh, hopefully approve it there right and then will it go out for 10 days is that right um yes okay yes okay so it'd go out for 10 days now and then it would come back to the commission right no he, he's saying that it would after the commission approves it after no, the Go ahead, Pat. If you let me make this change and we either either uh, validate it like through a text or email or something so that we can start vetting it tomorrow. OK, then it'll be, out, it'll be out for 10 days. And the normal process is it comes back. It goes to the next finance committee, which would be early June. And then it would go to the June commission meeting. All I'm asking is Susan mentioned that it has been done in the past that if you really want to get something out that that if if it's a nominal change uh, from the from the feedback we get, then we, we could maybe make a, 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 a request of the committee to go right to commission. However, I anticipate the 10 percent sampling will draw a lot of feedback. So I, I have I'm, I would I would sense that uh, getting little feedback is not going to happen. Uh, so I just think what's going to happen is we'll just get the feedback. We'll be back here in June and with uh with the feedback updated and the directive will go out at at, uh, at at the June commission meeting if everything's successful. Now from the audit provider community community perspective, they would like to have a final directive on May 20th, but if they don't get it, they will at least know what's going to be in it. 
and it has to go through the Finance Committee and then the Commission in June. All right. Okay, so um, Barry, you made a motion, so we just need a second on the addition of that um, item to page 12 under the um, fines, I believe, mm -hmm. is what it's called. So can I get a second on that? I just need Pat to give me a clarification on okay. uh, how he had worded it just now. I'm not against it. I am for it. I just want to make sure okay. the well, wording is proper. Okay. Um, we, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I wrote down what they said, but if, if, if a violation occurs in consecutive years, the penalties for the second year would double. I don't, I don't know if yeah. this is the right word. What's the right word? Fines. Fines assessments. Yes. Like that. We, we'll work with that sentence, and that's okay. that's the gist of it. Okay. And, uh, we'll work with it, and we'll get that right. sentence. Right. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right. The motion um, passes. Um, for these directives to be um, um, edited um, in terms of uh, assessment and fines, and um, and then we'll we'll take another look at it um, after it goes out for ten the, the ten days. Uh, okay, all right. So next item on the agenda: cost reports. Sure. The biggest kickback you would get on the ten percent. Um, I think the kickback would be when, if I go to Babcock Center, mm -hmm. and they have, you know, uh, incredible high number of of, of transactions. Ten percent of a big number is a big number, and if you're going to test ten percent of uh, of uh, of all your residential billings. That's a big number. And, and they would say, you know, what are we doing this for? It, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's overkill. That's what I, that's the feedback I would anticipate. But we, but you know, internal audit has lived with this for many, many years. And you know, you're making the point that you're getting insufficient samples. Right. They're, they're making the point. It might be oversampling from my perspective, not having been one of the original cook, I think 10% probably is a little high, but I think we need to get the feedback and then we can adjust accordingly. Okay. So we, do, we need more than what we have now right. because what we're finding now shows that there are Medicaid billing issues in the community. So we probably do need to increase the sample where that cutoff is. I think, you know, th they made a decision 10%. Let's, let's get some feedback and then we will, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out and make a recommendation to, to the committee. Hopefully, uh, that won't be the day of the meeting. In other words, no, 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 no. Yes, okay. yes. We'll, we'll send that in advance. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Okay. To the next item, cost reports. Okay. On co on cost reports, yeah. um, the fiscal year thirteen cost report we have. Right. Um, cost reports have two components. They have the cost, which is. 99% of the work, and then you compare it to the Medicaid billable revenue for that same year, and then you make a determination whether you have a payback or not. Right, right. now, uh, Deborah is collecting the Medicaid billable revenue, and HHS is also running their reports. And we have to be very careful in how we collect that because codes have changed. I mean, one of the problems with doing this eight years after you should have done it is we have to make sure that when we're pulling these codes up, we're not leaving costs on the floor. So we have to check the the uh, the IT table to make sure that we have all the codes right and that when we pull these reports that they're accurate. And what we ask HHS to do is run their reports and then we're going to compare them. And then from there, we can make a determination as to whether we have a payback or not. And that's really important for us because um, I think we're going to we're going to do 15, uh, uh, 15, 14 and 15 at the end of the month. So we're pulling revenue for all 13, 14, 15, and fiscal year 19, so that when these other three reports come in, we'll have the Medicaid revenue billings waiting for them so that we can make a quick determination as to our liability. Because I think that is a, um, 
that's an issue. If the liability is low, that gives us a lot of running room with our cash reserves. And if the liability is high, it's it's not so much. So we, we need to get that number and um, we should have those numbers. We should have the reports all done by end of May and the Medicaid revenues, I would hope, at the end of May as well. And we should give you a preliminary, we should give you a preliminary report uh, because I have to I have to put my name on it. So I have to go, I have to walk through the cost reports and through the work papers to make sure the allocations were done in a reasonable manner. And after talking to the CPAs, I have high confidence that they know what they're doing. This is their, this company specializes in cost reports. And I was, I was shocked at how good they were. I was shocked how good they were. So they will not be hard to review. And, and, uh, and then I can affix my name to them as, uh, uh, as, as accurate. Yeah. So you, indicated to me that you're waiting for the f the fiscal year 13 me uh, Medicaid revenue, correct? Yes. yes. When, do you, when do you expect to receive that? Uh, we've been working on it for about a week, and one of our challenges is to make sure that we have the codes correct, that we're pulling them from the database correctly, and that we're not missing any revenue. Uh, some of our early reports gave us pause as to the accuracy, and that's why it's taking a little bit longer than we'd like. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody have any uh, questions on cost reports? You think maybe by the next time we meet, you'd have that uh, 13 done? I would, I would absolutely hope so, or we need a new computer system. Okay. And 14 and 15. Yes. Yes. And 14 and 15. Okay. I don't have any other ones. Okay. All right. Well, if no one else has any other questions on this topic, we will move to uh, the administrative contract. There's nothing to go on the cost reports, is it? It's just information, right? Yeah. Correct. Some... Correct. Yeah. Moving on. Okay. Constance, you can hit administrative contract. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the administrative contract. So really briefly, the contract is in its final stages. It has been reviewed by both DDSN staff and DHHS staff. It has now been submitted to Director Kerr for um, approval on DHHS's side. Um, DDSN staff, to include myself, um, Pat Maley, and an Associate Director of Policy, Susan Beck, met with Margaret Allawine of DHHS to hash out the final details of the contract on last week, I believe it was April 29th. Um, at that time, we also submitted those questions that I received at the last commission meeting um, to Ms. Allawine because the questions posed had to be answered by DHHS. Um, but it's important to note that the questions were not substantial or material such that it should delay the execution um, of the contract. Um, we also met at our monthly meeting with Director Kerr and all of his executive staff on yesterday. Um, I inquired about the status of the contract from Margaret Allawine. She indicated that the contract had been reviewed by DHHS's legal staff and all of their appropriate program staff, um, and it had been submitted to Director Kerr for review, but of course, he's just started, so he's been very busy, um, and he assured me that he would try to get the contract reviewed as soon as possible. Um, but we don't anticipate that he's going to have any changes thus far because it's already been reviewed by all of his folks. So we anticipate getting the contract back in the next couple of weeks and it's ready for signature. Okay. All right. Um, anybody have any questions um, regarding the administrative contracts? Informational only, just following back up from the last commission meeting that had when we had some questions about the contract and um, so just getting an update from Constance on on that for today. So anybody have any um, any other questions or any questions? Okay. All right. So um, thanks, Constance. I guess we'll move to the fee for service update. Okay, I have uh, three components to this update. Um, um, in the package we sent out last night, last week, 
we had not completed the, the paperwork for the uh, band G to H swaps. Since then we have, uh, I think today, Christy sent out a draft to everybody. So I'm not asking for a vote because I think you need to see the documents well in advance before you have a vote. So we were, I, I plan on presenting that to the commission on May 20th. But just because I had the draft, I wanted to give it to you because you're the finance committee. And uh, what the draft says is basically what we've been saying for months is uh, um, why we're doing it, um, that that uh, uh, the, the data collection that we had, the HRST was an assessment tool. That information was brought to uh, 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 Rufus Britt and, and some of his staff to make a determination on uh, approving band G's to H's and H's to G's. Um, and in the document, it, it talks about the methodology of, of, of uh, uh, what we're looking for. And, um, and after Rufus looked at the 36 that had been completed, um, 34 of them he approved and two he did not. We still have 10 outstanding where we have done the HRST review of the band G to H, which is the more critical one. That's where they're asking for money. Uh, and the 10 corresponding H's to G's uh, were assigned to other staff outside the risk division. And they're going to take care of it uh, this week so that we can make a final, maybe edit this document. So on the 20th, we can put all 46 band swaps to bed. Rufus, did I miss anything? So that's that's just for information. I'm not asking for a vote. Um, right. And then, uh, and again, that's just that was just, in my opinion, that was that was a cleanup phase of this whole process. 25% uh, of the providers participated. 75% did not. Um, that's that's one of the challenges of our system, where if we don't have a comprehensive tool to assess people's acuity and correspondence to payment, we're kind of at the mercy of of um, of of people. We have so many people to go through, we can't go through it in a short amount of time. Um, the second issue is uh, we're now we're getting to the financial component. Um, we sent out a communication to all the providers, uh, advising them of uh, to request for requests for outliers for uh, residential bands, as well as if they have uh, band G's that they want to go to H's that weren't covered, uh, that we will review them. And they're being sent to a central portal. And every Friday, Rufus and his team are looking at them. And that portal has been open probably for almost a month, three or four weeks. And we received five or six to date. Three providers, five or six. That was the last I heard. Yep. OK. Yeah. And so what we plan on doing is reviewing them like we normally do on outliers. and. Uh, bringing them to the commission and uh, making recommendations for those that deserve outliers because you know normally we have the authority to do that but in this particular case because it was tied to the band B's and I's uh, everybody thought it was best interest any increases based on the BNI issue come back to the commission to be approved so we'll just batch them and bring them to the commission every month until we work our way through all the outlier requests that could be coming. And as a reminder, we haven't had outlier requests uh, in three years because of financial situation. Right. Okay. And then the last, the last thing when you're on fee for service, I really, you know, with with all the activity, and and it said in a lot of act, in, in, a, in it said, but the volume of activity tends to drown this point out. And I want to make it because you asked a good question. Um, going to fee for service is is a two prong step. The first prong is to move the at-home services to fee-for-service, which has been completed on January 1st. And I would say the 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 post-system change where you get a lot of things that maybe you didn't anticipate. I'm I'm very pleased that we had a few little bills that we didn't pick up here and there that we we're able to correct. Uh, I didn't see a big. I mean, I was I thought it was rather smoothly. Um, and, and that's the that's a vast majority of our physical transactions, but only represents about 26% of our, our waiver dollars. Moving residential to fee-for-service is a different lift in that in order for us to make that happen, we have to have a waiver amendment to our IDRD waiver. As Susan mentioned last time, we're, we're in the middle of doing an IDRD renewal 
And that renewal has to take place and get approved. And once it's approved, at that point, we can then go for an amendment. And so I'm saying this because the waiver renewal is not expected to go into effect until January 1st of 22. So the soonest we can have an amendment is after January 1st of 22. And the amendment, which we plan on working on in calendar year 21, has to amend the, the IDRD waiver so that each of our residential settings is described in greater detail, particularly the staffing levels that are associated with, in, in simple terms, low, medium, and high service levels, so that we can then justify a corresponding rate, presumably a higher rate for low, medium, and high service levels. Uh, so that work has to be done in calendar year 21. The waiver uh, renewal has to take place by January 1st of 22. And then the amendment has to take place after that. And when the amendment takes place, now we're in a position to have a fee for service to go residential. So that's the timeline that we're working on. How much after January 1st of 22 is, is to be determined. I know everybody involved has a sense of urgency that that has to happen sooner rather than later, but we are not gonna be able to flip fee for service residential in calendar year 21. That is not a happy um, thing to hear. Is, um, I hear some feedback. I don't know if somebody wants to put their, um, their um, yeah, on mute. That's the sound of freedom, by the way. It's, it's air <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> Um. Okay, so, Pat, I don't know, do you remember that document that was titled Implementation Plan for Fiscal, for Fee-for-Service, dated January 1, 2021? It was a, a plan that kind of documented the steps of the process, um, what needed to happen. It was like 17 I, steps listed I, on I, the version that I have. Well, go ahead. I, I, I'm sure I did it. I'm sure we did it. Yeah. I just was curious if if you had that, you know, handy no, in, in your so that we could I could ask you um you know where we are in that long, you know, in that document. Like what phase are we on in that document? Um and so you can get you can get back to me on that if if you don't have it now. I just um wanted to make sure I asked you that. Um so um I think it would be also helpful to add what what you just said, and I and I'm not even sure. It's, I think you said it, you know, relatively plainly. But I'm just what you just said really needs to be added to that document she's talking I will, about. I will I will update that for you, no problem. Because um, because we have to figure out where we're going to go from here with that situation because. Um, I don't want to talk about it here, but this commission is under pressure to go to fee for service. But I think I'm hearing Pat, if I'm not mistaken, 21, 2021, there's some correction factors that have to come into play so that we'll be where we need to be at in 2022. Right, that are not- I hear exactly what he's saying, but I also know about the pressures we're under. Right, so but, that, but mm -hmm. there's a process that I'm hearing. Yes, that we it's, have to follow. It, it's it's really it's really the the waivers have to be amended by HHS to CMS to accommodate these settings, and that's that's what it, it, and it is a level of um, detail because what we're doing is we're infusing staffing levels in each setting. And that is that is a very um, uh, it's important. That's one of the most that's one of the most uh, critical health and safety issues that have proper staffing uh, associated with what we're paying for, um, and that has to be implemented. And then we have to have time to get it in the waiver. Uh, I'm just making that known that that is a constraint that is of we we will work on it. But I can tell you until the waiver renewal is done and done, we will not be able to amend something until it's completed. I agree with that because otherwise you get off the mark. You can't 
the corrective factors would be extremely difficult to get back to. I would think just, I think, I'm going to say this, there is no silver lining because we want to get the fee for service. But from a practical standpoint, the way we do it now, the band is equivalent of a, we still have to, we have to still cost settle it, but it is equivalent to an, a monthly payment at the beginning of the month as opposed to at the end of the month. Um, it's very easy to budget for. Uh, I'd rather be, I'd rather go to fee for service, but it is not, it doesn't carry the risk of bad home services where utilization can go up and down that we can't control in a band. We can control utilization in residential settings. So it is much more budgetable. It's much more manageable. I think we need to get the fee for service so we can get out of some of these cost settlement issues. Um, but uh, we, we, I know me and, and, and Constance, we have, we have talked to HHS uh, uh, multiple times and they've assured us, we just, matter of fact, we heard it yesterday, Margaret, who's our point of contact over there, was so on target with exactly what needs to be done. And as they're working with Mercer on the rates, Mercer's starting to see these same issues that need to be done. So uh, there's energy behind getting us there. Um, I was telling you, these are, these are the, uh, um, the, 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 the milestones that we have to get past. And I will update that January 21 so people can see exactly the milestones in front of us. All right. Anyway, in the next few days, can we update that report that, that, that Robin's talking about and have you put that exact information, what you said here today, in there? Sure, sure. And and may and get and just get it to the finance committee, please, or get it to the commission, please. Sure. Because yeah. we have to, then the commission needs to discuss what we what you know needs to look at that and discuss it. Stephanie, I just want to say thank you, Pat. I appreciate you being so honest with us. I think this really helps us to understand you know the the true process that's got to go on, and um, at least at this point, we know you know. If it doesn't happen by January the 1st, it's not because we didn't want it to, we, we weren't trying to make it go there. Basically, at some point, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's kind of out of our hands yeah, until they do, until they, do, until who, and that, that's the question is, who needs to, to do something? DHHS. Is DHHS, so it's, we're basically putting the ball in their court, and I, and I'd like to, you know, for us to engage them and find out kind of a timeline. So when you do update that time sheet, if they could give us a timeline of what they anticipate, so we can hold them accountable. Um, well, that's true, but you got to remember, Stephanie, we're asking for rate increases. <laughs> that's not an easy thing to ask for. True. And so that's that's the whole point of we've been we've been going around and around in circle with for a long time about rate increases and we have to have them and we can't do it without it and all that. And 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 they keep saying, go ahead and do, or the, the past HHS director, not this one, kept saying, go ahead and go to FIFA service anyway. And, and of course we didn't. And so that's where we are. It's, it's, we're asking for rate increases. We're not asking, if we were dividing the rate by 365, then everything would be fine, but we're not dividing the rate by 365. We're asking for a rate increase on those on those three different levels. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing and I'm not saying they wouldn't approve it. What I'm saying is that's been the sticking point or part, a big part of the sticking point all along, but it just, it just seems to a lot of people outside of this agency that we are dragging our feet on fee for service. And, it's, and it, it just, it's not good. I, I understand why we're doing it, but explaining that to people in a sound bite is not easy. That's right. I, I, I agree, agree with you there, and that's that is a true struggle for us. And 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 I've heard it just like you have, Barry. And um and I think this will help us to be able to say, look, you know, we we are prepared to do what you know to go there, but we can't get the cooperation we need from this agency to do that. And as soon as they cooperate, then we will. So at least we it's out of. In other words, I I want to know who's stopping it, and. And I think we need to make it clear that we're prepared to go that way, but we can't go that way until someone else does what they're supposed to do. HHS is 100% behind it. The, the, the new group there really gets it. Okay. Um, I think, I think the, 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 the power curve to develop these settings was greater than people anticipated. 
is, and okay. we couldn't we couldn't get it in the renewal in the time available, and we tried to get delays from CMS, and CMS said, "Look, just do the renewal and then have your amendment ready to go." And so we're doing what CMS told us to do. So I think everybody's in that firing train okay. to get to the finish line, and my own the only a, a positive aspect is HHS can still raise their current single rate to us and we can pass that on through the bands until we get the fee for service. I'd rather not do that, but yeah. we're, we're not helpless until we get the fee for service. And the, the you know, the, the, the Senate approved us for a $10 million increase. If they gave us the money, we would, we would put that right in the bands uh, and they would have the increase on July 1st. So my point is, is I believe getting fee for service for the at home way was the harder lift. This is this is going to get done. This is an easier lift in my mind. It's just yeah. getting the dominoes to line up to get the waiver amended and get the rates ready to go. And then we're, we're off to a fee for service uh, situation. Well, twice, cut once. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I, I appreciate you being honest with us, Pat, and giving us a, a legitimate answer in, in letting us know what we're facing. And I, I just want you to know how much I appreciate your honesty and your openness about this. We'll, we'll, we'll update that and it'll be it'll be uh, in, in black and white. Thank you, sir. All right. So any other questions before we move on to... Um... The next item on the agenda, proposed non-service contracts, 200,000 or greater. Okay. All right, Pat, next okay. item. Okay. Um, this part of the agenda is is um, a, a new part of agenda that, that we should handle every month. And when we pass the commission policy uh, uh, for the, for the $200,000 um, threshold to alert the commission, um, you know, uh, prior to any execution of non-service funds, um, we there still was some questions about what is what is the exact process we're going to use at the committee level and the commission level. So these three that I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm really looking for guidance to you as to do you want to pass these on to the commission level? And my recommendation would be yes until everybody's comfortable in delegating down. And, and, and the example I will give you is, um, as I walk through them, you'll see the pattern that's coming from these type of contracts. And then we can make a dis determination as to, uh, do you want to see the original contract or do you want to see, um, because a lot of our contracts I call are, are qualifying contracts. And let me go through the first one and that will give you an example as to probably what 66% of the non-service contracts look like. Okay. Uh, the first one solicitation that ends with 9196. Yeah. Um, this is a fixed price bid contract. And uh, and I'm not going to get into the details. I'll, get, I'll, I'll just give you the bigger picture so we're not here till 5 o'clock. Um, these fixed bid uh, uh, contracts are situations where procurement wants to establish a qualified vendor list. And so they'll say, if you provide this service under these requirements, and get on this list, the contract's going to last for five years and it's going to total $250,000. In this particular case, four vendors applied and they were all they were all approved. And if you look at their contracts, each one's holding a $250,000 contract. Well, that's misleading in a little bit because really the whole contract's worth two hundred fifty. dollars Once we spend two fifty, dollars whether we spend it on one of them or all four of them, that contract's over and we're on to the next contract. So my point is, when we roll this out and get the contract approved, it, w it, it will, in this particular case, um, it was approved before, the, before, the, um, uh, before we had the new commission policy, where four vendors became qualified providers of basically direct, basically they're providing us uh, direct care staff. The, the reason we're here for this solicitation is a fifth provider wants to get on that list. So basically the fifth provider is saying, hey, I want to get on that list. And and we're qualifying them that they're on that list. So it could be this same contract two months from now. I could have two other people apply for it to get on that list. Am I? Is that correct, Candace? Hiding behind there. Yes. And so the whole point is, do you want to see the first contract 
and everybody who's qualifying to get on are just the first contract and future people that qualify, we just add them to the list knowing that the contract really hasn't changed. It's just we have more people to choose from. And I, I would recommend that we approve every contract at its inception. And when we approve a contract at its inception, there will be two, three or four people getting qualified. But anytime over the next five years, other people can become qualified. I don't know if we want to bring them back in front of you. You follow me? Because the contract is still ceiling is still $250,000. So, uh, and we don't have to decide that today. All we have to decide today is we have this solic solicitation where the vendor consolidated medical staffing wants to get on the qualified list and, um, and the award has not been done yet. Correct. And, um, but it's in process and MMO will make the award because when you have a contract at that level, they're the ones that make the awards on our behalf. So what we're looking for is, is approval for us to accept this new person on the list. But in many ways, we really can't prevent it because the contract already been let and people can apply as long as they qualify, they get on the list. Does that make sense? And I think we're going to see a lot of that on the non-service side. And we have to decide how much you want to see. GSA is using that same procedure guideline. Great. And uh, all you were saying is that I'm on that list. This contract is worth up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right. I may get an increment of ten thousand, twenty-five thousand, hundred thousand, but when we get to that two fifty, that's it on that contract. All the con all the qualified providers combined two fifty. Two fifty. Yeah. Okay. I may get no work. Okay. So you just you following GSA guy. Right. So, and and before we. Discuss that. Let me compare it with the second one, which is what we would traditionally talk about a contract. The second one is solicitation ending 0880. And this is this is solicitation where DDSN and Departmental Health went they they went in on it together because we both need this equipment and we have certain the power of uh, of uh, uh, higher dollars gets us a better price. So this contract went out and it was. Um, uh, I, it hasn't been awarded yet. And as a matter of fact, I don't think I can talk about it. Loud, right, Candace? Um, you're fine because you didn't um, participate in the process. Yeah, it did. The, the bottom line is we, we, we said I have a contract. Somebody um, it, it has, has been recommended and they gave us a price and, and it was over 200000 But our piece is a small compared to the Department of Mental Health. And what we would do is at the end of the day is if if we are just starting this contract today, as opposed to it's probably in the fourth quarter, we would come to you and say, hey, we want to uh, set an RFP out for this type of equipment. Expect it's going to cost more than $200,000. And then you would approve us to do that. And then when we, when we ultimately get the bid and say the bids, you know, just unrelated to this contract, $260,000, you know, we would come back and say we had $260,000 bid and you would say we approve it. And that's just like, that's a one contract. You follow me? You still follow me? Yes. Thing, yes. Know. And so, and we do that with a CPIP model currently. We come to you and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. And you, and you say, go do it. And then when we actually get to the contract stage, we say, hey, we have this contract that we put out there and so-and-so bid for $492,000. And then the commission approves the beginning and the end. You follow me? And so my recommendation for these contracts over $200,000, you would want to approve the RFP going out. So why do all this work if you if you don't want us to buy uh, you know some sort of computer equipment, and then at the finish line you know if the if the if we're expecting a two hundred fifty thousand dollar bid and it comes in at you know a million, you know we may want to down. So I think in the future these type of contracts should be RFP and the actual contract. In this case, what we're asking you to do, we're bringing it before you only because we're we we're not even to the contract part but we're beyond the RFP part. So I want to let you know that this contract's out there and that what I anticipate happening is um, us getting uh, a number and then we probably have to come back at the commission meeting, Candace, with the number. We have, um, I sent it to you the other day, but it's 328,000. Right. But our portion would be to start off for this contract for the retherm equipment. That's just for the retherm equipment and supplies 
for the initial. Um, there is a five-year contract for the supplies, so we can buy like replacement um, um, bowls and stuff like that, supplies um, throughout the duration of the contract. I still see your GSA procedures you're following. You're right on the money. Okay, so in, in this in this particular case, because um, we're in it with somebody else, we have to decide whether to accept it or not accept it. Right. Um, and what, what I'd ask for here is because we're in the fourth quarter of a contract and we may not be able to control when we close it. Is that right, Candace? Well, they postponed the award, but it's supposed to be tomorrow, depending on your decision today. Yes. So, um, right. Right. So, so we, we would like approval to uh, post the award at $328,000, which we think is a reasonable expense. It is critical need based on yeah, purchase food from BMH at Midlands. And it's the only way we can keep food warm from to the, to the rooms. Um, and we've been wrestling this for a long time. And the contract is going to be, because it's a joint contract, may be decided tomorrow. So we'd like authority to continue with this going on, knowing that in the future, before we even send the RFP out, you will have a bite at the apple at that time. Does that make sense? Make all the sense in the world. Okay. So that's all. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, that does make sense. The key thing that we want to remember about these contracts and approval of the contracts, as far as I understand it from the last meeting we had regarding this matter, is that a, we wanted to see all the consulting contracts is what we were is what we were most concerned about. And B is that we wanted an executive summary of the other contracts so that we'd see if we wanted to see the contract or not. That was that was the other big key. So you really want an executive summary of these things so we know which ones we want to evaluate closer and which ones we don't need to evaluate closer. Because obviously if we're buying some that is some sort of food or some sort of thing like you're talking about right now, it's almost you know, it would be almost impossible that we would not approve that because it's a, it's basically a, you know, a, a necessity. A necessity is right. It, they, good. I'm glad you're better with words than me. <laughs> a necessity. So therefore, we would just move on from that. Yeah. Madam Chair, I'm in agreement with uh, Pat's recommendation. Okay. Um. I'm, I'm not so, Pat, do you? want to talk about the third item on here because I don't think we have yet or do you want to, us to put on my second um I, I don't I don't think this, this, go ahead and vote on the second one I'm sorry say that again you broke up and vote on this one here I, I, I if you just make a recommendation that let us continue with the process and uh, close on on the offer that we think is reasonable three hundred twenty thousand dollars I can so move on that, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. Can I get a second? You mean this just this particular contract for keeping the warm the food warm? Is that what we're doing right now? Yes. yes. Therm okay, second. Okay. All in favor? Say hi. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Um, I'll do the last the last one, 0743. Again, okay. um, this is a little bit more complicated one only because of the history. Um In, in June of last, year, we have a we have a contract every we have a service contract every year for a program um, that is known as the, the Perry Program Post Acute Rehabilitation Initiative. It's out of the Haskey Program, and this is a state funded program, and its current budget for fiscal year 21 is 3.6 million dollars. And in June of last year, when we proposed our contract for this fiscal year, this contract was in it. So the commission of last year approved staff here to spend $3.6 million in the Perry program. Uh, and we are very close to spending that this year. The reason we did this contract was we have a Cracker Jack procurement officer who identified, <laughs> oh, you have that. We do. <laughs> And she's identifying contracts that we have been using without competition. And yeah. so what we're doing is we are posting this contract in a competitive environment. And the people, there's four providers that generally do this for us. And they're going to have to be get on the qualified list. But on top of that, they're going to have to submit what they would charge us, meaning 
if they lower their bid, they might get most of the business or predominantly the number of bids. So we're, we're infusing competition into the system. And what this contract will do is it's already been solicited. I think we already have, uh, the, I think we, we're, I think we're, we have probably received the, not yet. Give it to next week. Okay. Offers, we won't know who did it or send an offer until next week. And the tentative date for award is 521. Right. So what we're, what we're asking for is this qualified content will qualify, it'll qualify providers for a five year period with an annual cap of $3.6 million, which we have been doing for a number of years. It's gone up each, it goes up periodically when we need more money. Um, and it's going to give us the vehicle for fiscal year 22 to um, to use to spend those funds in a more competitive environment. So what I'm looking for a, a approval here is to allow us to continue this project. We are truly inside the 10 yard on this project that when we get the bids and it's not even the bids, we're going to qualify people and they will make the awards on the 21st. Um, just let us complete that transaction so we can get a qualified provider list. And then when this fiscal year runs out, which is, um, we already have contracts in place for, for, count for fiscal year 21 with four providers. When they run out, we will use this vehicle starting on July 1st of 21 for the next five years. There's four providers? That's what we currently have now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many have put in, I assume the four put in for this. Uh, maybe five or six could put in for this. All right. uh, but it and again, it's in between. If this, if we were starting this over from today, we would we would want approval to issue the RFP, and then we would come back at the end. We have the um, uh, 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 qualified list to finalize the contract. Okay, so basically, what happens is you would then bring it back to the commission, yes. and then we would vote on yes that qualified. Yes, list. yeah. I'm in agreement with that, Madam Chair. All right. Um. So, um, I think going back to your original question, Pat, um, you know, do we want to review these types of things um, during a committee meeting or do we want to bring it to the commission meeting and discuss it? And my, my thinking, now that you've kind of gone through these three examples that actually need, you know, action on, um, that we would that we would um, just bring these to the, the committee and have the committee, this committee, um, you know, spend time on looking at all this in, in, in detail like we are right now and 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 asking questions and getting what we, we need um, and not bringing each one of these every time to the full commission. That's kind of what I'm I'm feeling, I don't know, you know, how others feel, but that was what you asked earlier on, right, Pat? I, I do, and I think from a governance standpoint, the mere fact that you get vision on these, you're doing your due diligence that you know what's going on, and then you can make a determination as to, hey, this one's, this one is, we're not too sure about this one, and you, you can discretionary bring something up if you think it is okay. of, of significance, but I believe these are, a lot of these are pretty much routine things and more importantly when we when we when we clear out the backlog and we're starting fresh if we're doing an rfp for like a new computer system that's going to cost us you know two million dollars a year i think that would get a whole lot more scrutiny on the rfp side it would have a whole lot more scrutiny probably when we're doing the vetting of the of the, of the candidates and that may be something that you would probably know from the get-go is going to end up at the commission level because it's 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 enterprise-wide impact. So I think you will not be surprised uh, um, by, by contracts coming out of nowhere that need to go to the commission once we clear what's in process. Okay. And and I don't think you're gonna get something as complicated as the Perry contract. That's kind of, a, that's kind of an anomaly because it's, act, it's actually a service contract. Madam Chair, I can so move on your recommendation. Okay. All right. Um, anybody want a second? I guess that for this discussion of 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 looking at these in committee, determining in committee whether or not we need to bring a certain item to the commission um, through this process that we've that, that Pat is uh, outlined. 
can I get a second on that just as an agreement? Well, we never discussed anything about my executive summary comment. So what, so are, are they going to be executive summary? Is that where they're going to be? So I view this as an executive summary of what we received. Uh, do you, do you, were you thinking something different than what we received in from Pat for in our No, package? I'm just saying, I'm just saying is all of the contracts going to be in this executive summary form? I mean, are we making a decision that all of the contracts are going to be in this kind of form? Um, um, I think you're you saying, are we going to vote on that? Or are we just asking Pat to say, can you confirm that these are the types of summaries we're going to get for each contract? Well, I'm not saying we don't necessarily have to vote on it as long as he agrees that's what we're going to do or and or if that's what we want to do. I'm trying to figure out what we as a commission, a committee want to do. I'm not saying we want to do that or, or don't. I personally think we do. But I mean, okay. I'm one member out of three. So I'm trying to figure out what we want to do as a commission because I don't think that was discussed. So I think I I assumed that the what we got today is going to serve as an example of what we'll get going forward, which includes an executive executive summary of the contract, where it is in the, the phase, what the, the potential cost is going to be, and that we would decide we we decided going forward we want to continue and have this routine continued in this committee. And then we would um, bring certain items to the commission when we determine that. I think for today's purpose, I don't know if we need to bring these to the commission. Um, I was thinking that we are going to just vote on what we he needs to move forward particularly with item two um that has a deadline with it um and that that's that's how i saw it in terms of for today and then i, I don't have any problem with how you see it at all all i'm saying is that if we're going to do it that way that's fine but we have to let the commission know that's how we're doing it and then that we will bring to them when we see it necessary as a finance committee I can what do that. they yeah. want to say and yeah. then we want to see what they, the rest of them, think of that. Okay. Yeah. So I that's can. That's all I'm saying. I think I think what you're saying is fine. I'm just saying that I want to make sure that the executive summary is in is in each one of them and the, and and all of those things you just said. But I, I just think that we need to make sure that before we leave here today, that everybody in the room, two fifty one, understands what we're saying, so there's no misunderstanding three months from now about what we expect. Yeah. My sole move still stands. Yeah. <laughs> just to clarify, just to lower, I mean, I, I think we use this as an executive summary. I think what we'll do in the future, we've kind of bumped into a time constraint getting this out. We will just link the contracts so that you're not getting, you know, hundreds of pages of contracts. And then if you want to put some sort of, some sort of uh, uh, block system on it so that when we actually meet, you can check, uh, you know, kept that committee due diligence completed or referred to commission. Uh, we can give you whatever you want, but uh, um, we, we, unless you tell me different, I'll, you'll see this every month, or you'll see me affirmatively say we have no contracts over two hundred thousand dollars. My sole move still stands. <laughs> I know that's funny the way. I mean, that's, that's I think that's some guy. I mean, I think he's trying to be funny, but but. <laughs> I guess with the clarification he just made, because I think that's a clarification what he just made. So to me, that's not the same thing as the as the uh, as the as the point of what we were making. But if you want to if if you want to say that 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 with the clarification he just made, then I think that it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So with the clarification yeah. that yeah. Pat made, confirming what the agency is going to do going forward regarding contracts over 200,000 for this subcommittee um, committee meeting. Um, can, can I get a second on that? The only thing I would add is I think, I think Commissioner Malfress is maybe, maybe I'll draft a procedure and send it to Commissioner Blackwood. It would be this committee's procedure on how it's going to handle it so that when you go to the commission meeting, 
you can present to them something in writing as to, hey, this is how we plan on handling these. And then maybe at the commission meeting, you vote and say, hey, we agree with that procedure. And then all yeah. of a sudden, we're good to go. Yep. That's right. That's right. We're trying to get a procedure is what right. we're trying to so, do. So I will draft that for you, Commissioner Blackwood. Okay. That all right. sounds Okay. All right. So all right. Um, next, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm going to carry that. Well, I mean. Are we going what? to vote or not? Yeah. So I guess, um, Barry, you second it, right? Yeah, the, yeah, with, with the with the clarification that he just said he would give us a procedure. That's what I was. That's really. I I, I guess it would have taken less time if I'd have said that. But that's yeah. what I was trying to get to. All right. So, uh, Barry um, seconded. Uh, All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. I'll I'll try to speed this up while we're under the under the contract issue. This is just for awareness. No votes. Um, I I have three contract issues that um, I will bring to the commission meeting for a vote next time. And the reason the reason I'm not bringing it now is because what ends up happening is when we send you the hard copy materials, I think anything that happens after that date and before this date, it's, it's not it's not fair to ask for a vote when you haven't seen any paperwork. So what we what I'm going to but I don't want to surprise you in the commission meeting. But what we're going to what, what I'm going to ask for the issues to be brought to the commission that have the contracts are uh, are three things. One is um, the Perry contract I just talked about, we have spent three 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 million five hundred thousand dollars on it so far, and the budget's three point six. Um, they have more work to do in the in the final quarter of the year, and so we are, I authorized the program to continue providing those state funds over three point six million dollars because uh, people are in need and we have funds. But I'm going to formally ask for that. At the next commission meeting to go over because i anticipated going over two hundred thousand um, dollars same thing we have a fiscal agent in jasper its contract ends on june 30th of this year and uh for reasons i'll get into at the commission meeting we had to make a change yeah. and we currently have two fiscal agents one in jasper one at charles lee and and uh jasper for a number of reasons we had to move it um and and so we're going to move it to Charles Lee effective July 1st. And part of that is we're going to have to have an emergency contract just to have Charles Lee accept it. And then we're going to do an RFP to bid it out at a later date. Uh, and, and the reason this is critical is because uh, as we enter uh, as we enter EVV into our system, these self-directed um, services are going to be kind of at, at a very center of the EVV process where electronic verification and we got to make sure that that system snaps in with our fiscal agent so that as the care workers are providing services that their time gets recorded correctly it goes to the fiscal agent and everything's done electronically that's why we had to get everything in one place in a quick amount of time to recover from jasper just not being able to not not go beyond june 30th um and, I, and you might hear some traffic about that. Um, there's there's uh, two other things that will come. One other thing will come at the uh, commission meeting is back in 2016 and 17, we had a lot of hurricanes and floods, as you're all aware of. And FEMA had these, these generator grants. And they had a number of them. They were like backed up five. They were five pending at a time. And uh, the commission at that time authorized us to pay the 25% federal match on any generator. And so as of May of 19, we had we had uh, close to, I think, 25 approved and we had three pending. Well, the pending ones have since been approved and they're starting to get into the contract phase. And normally what we would do is when we get into the contract phase, because we have the authority to pursue it, Andrew would bid the contract and we'd come back to you with the contract and ask if we could do it. In this particular case, is kind of again, it's one of those idiosyncrasies in DDSN and state government. Uh, the Jasper DSN board is getting a generator, but because we own the property that the generator is going on, the uh, uh, downtown wants us to do a CPIP. Yes. So we're, we're going to do an interim CPIP at the May 20th, asking for approval of approximately $200,000 to put in this generator. And the history of this is the 
prior commission authorized us to go down this route. And it will cost us $50,000 to put in a generator at Jasper who's sitting right there on the coast and they need it probably more than any of us. So that's coming, but I don't need a vote. Uh, and there's one other thing I need, I need your concurrence on. And this is a little bit unique. Um, in, October of 50, in, in October of 20, former CFO Chris Clark presented the spending plan for fiscal year 21. And in there, we budgeted $500,000 for a computer project called VDI, yeah. which this handsome, this handsome guy to my right presented. Yeah. And they, and you guys approved it. Yeah. And it's needed. And then in January, yeah. uh, the mm -hmm. state came out with a pilot project and said, hey, we'll do it. And then it's going to cost you $30,000. Well, since yeah. that time, the state has pilot project has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. And so we have no pilot project to get on cheaply. So we have to revert back to our original plan, which is spend $500,000 for BDI. So the reason I'm bringing it to you is you gave us the authority to do it. Then we told you that, hey, we're jumping on this pilot. Well, now we're telling you the state's pilot has disappeared and we're going back to the original plan. So um, I know there was some, in you know, we still have the authority, but I wouldn't want to spend the money thinking that some of you remember that January conversation where we were going to get it for much cheaper. Right. So I don't need any kind of, uh, of um, you know, you know, uh, any kind of vote. I just want to tell you that we're executing the authority you gave us before. Conditions have changed. That is back on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes What's sense. the original again? Just 487000 Okay. I remember that. Yeah, I remember. I remember that discussion as well. Yeah, I remember distinctly. Yeah. So, so we, we, we had we had four hundred thousand dollars that we were anticipating, but now we give it back and now we're back to the original plan. So that's just advisement. Um, okay. and that's all I have for the contract component of this show. OK, did we need to actually approve any of the the three? I think no. the second. No, we yeah. didn't need to. I, I just I, I just don't want to go to the commission meeting and bring up a topic that you haven't heard about before. Okay. Like where was that two weeks ago when we had to, we had the committee meeting, and uh, just and, sure. and so these issues I would have presented to you if these issues had popped up before uh, I sent you the paperwork for this particular committee meeting. Right. Right. But, but Jasper and and, and uh, the the FEMA grant uh, just popped up within the last right. two three days. I'm I'm sorry. I meant to say the ones that you did send us information on in in your memo for. The, on the 30th, the, the pending non-service contract awards. Did we need to ad vote on anything right now regarding those, any of those three that you, you went over in detail and shared with us? I think you voted on on the latter two. I think you voted on okay. 0880 and 0743. You gave us permission to move forward. Okay. I remember the 0881, but I didn't know that. I didn't recall. I didn't remember that we actually did anything on the 743. Um, so we need to I, make sure the minutes reflect that we did something on both of them. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know who's doing minutes, but. Um, Christy is, and I'll double check it when I get it. Make She's sure. nodding her head. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that we okay. completed that, that, um, you know, discussion in full, okay. um, since we were kind of jumping all over the place about procedure and what yeah. we were going forward so okay all right so um the next item on the agenda is the financial audit planning um constance i, I see your name by that one so i'll let you start if you want and then i can add to it if you to. um so as requested by the commission i reached out to state auditor's office i spoke to sue um to moss is that correct correct chris yeah um um, upon my conversation with Sue, I thought it was a good idea to connect her directly with um, the several of the commission members. Um, that way, y'all could answer the questions that she had posed to me directly. So yesterday, um, Commissioner Blackwood, Commissioner Malfres, myself, um, Sue Moss, and George Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy the state um, yeah. um, participated in a um, phone call. And I'll let Commissioner Blackwood update you about that phone call. Okay. okay. 
Um, yes. So as as everyone recalls, um, we had brought up in our commission meeting that um, it would might be smart for us to do a comprehensive financial audit of DDSN. Um, and um, we had that discussion with the, the state auditor. Um, as Constance said yesterday, we, we kind of um, talked through what that might look like, the pros and cons of that. Um, and we determined through, you know, just to talking, talking with um, Mr. Kennedy, um, that that particular audit would not be um, probably beneficial. Um, that if there were certain items, areas, um, contracts, or, or things of the, of the like that we wanted um, him to specifically look, look at, he and his his um, team um, that we could do that um, as opposed to doing a a full financial audit. Um, he, you know, we we talked through it for a while, you know, for a while, and um, he um, just felt like if if we wanted him to specifically look at things that he could, you know, create something like an agreed upon procedure uh, agreement that um, he could look in certain areas, but he just didn't feel like it was um, necessary to do um, an agency audit. Um, and so that's kind of where we left things. Um, that was his, his, his recommendation. And so we, we are taking that recommendation and um, um, bringing it to, to this committee. Um, to make everyone aware of, of that. And, um, and really the next step would be for us to determine what types of things we want um, the, the state auditor to look into. Um, and and that's, that's kind of where things are. So anybody have any questions or, or thoughts on that for right now? I just wanted to give you that update um, on, on kind of uh, the, the discussion we had with the state auditor trying to determine, you know, what we should be looking at and what wasn't really effective and efficient right now. Robin, can you give us an, an, an explanation as to why he did not want anyone outside looking in? He, he specifically said that, you know, um, the, the audit in 2015 that was, was done um didn't really reveal anything um and that he felt like if we did repeated that same thing again that we probably would have a similar um a similar outcome and he he said that he thought it would be pretty costly to do another audit like that without, you know, a lot of specific results or, or evidence that we um, were hoping maybe to see, or, um, you know, it, he, he said that he felt like um, he could, if there were certain areas of concern that we had as commission, regarding finances of, of the agency specifically, that he could look at something specific for us. He'd be happy to do that. It'd be more efficient. It would be more, um, it would, you know, he, he really stressed how it was important for any concerns that we had could could certainly be addressed and should be addressed that he could he could help us you know look into something specific um and he wanted to do that um but he felt like the general financial audit um of ddsn was was probably not a good use of time and money um because i mean he said what are you looking for what are you hoping to to uncover and 
you know, I don't know, Barry, you, you had a lot of discussion with him on that as well, but. And there's one, go ahead. Go, I'm just going to let you kind of weigh in on that a little bit more to make sure I'm not missing anything on that, that conversation specifically. Well, the only thing I wanted to say about that conversation specifically is that, is that was so important to me was that due to how audits work, we have a $700 million budget. And so you would have to find, in order to have a finding that would be worth investigating, you'd have to find probably a million dollars. Because if you find 100,000 that you don't think is right or done right, they aren't even gonna use that. They aren't even gonna, gonna address that because it doesn't reach a point of a, fine, of a, of a material fact that, a, that an audit would worry about. So if we don't look for a specific thing, we're really not gonna find anything because we have such a large budget. And we're part of the, a big problem in my opinion we have is we're part of a state budget. We don't really have our own budget. We are part of a bigger state budget and our budget alone is 700 million. So an audit is just not going to get you where you want to be unless you have a specific idea as to where you want to be. And that's what, and, and that's why he believed they were disappointed and he was involved in the audit five years ago. And that's why he believed that the commission was disappointed in what they found out then. And he told them they were going to be disappointed and they, and, and, and he's convinced and I am too, that, that we would end up in the exact same boat we were in there and end up with the same thing about after that audit was finished, then we would say, well, these are specific things you want to look at. And so rather than doing that audit first, he just wants us to go straight to specific things we want to look at first. And he wants us to make a comprehensive list of what we want to, to, um, to look into. And I have a couple of things on my list. I don't have many yet, but, um, but, we, but that comprehensive list is going to solve our problem without having to do the financial audit for, without having to do the financial, um, without having to do the um, the first major expenditure um, first. So we're really going to the second step first, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But the key thing is the material fact. That's what you got to keep in mind, and how much money we'd be talking about to get to to reach a material fact. That's why. That's why the the regular audit doesn't is not practical. Madam Chair. Yes. I'm fine with all of that. Just get an email from uh, the state auditor. Get an email yeah. from me, and we good with that. Just get the email. I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. So we get an email. Stephanie, do you have any any, any other questions or thoughts on on kind of going a different route? specific route i guess no, I, I just you know i'm just saying we need to i don't know what kind of questions to look i don't even know what to tell them to look for yeah but <laughs> it wouldn't do any good for me to tell them anything at this point right well he did yeah. say he did say if there was you know a, a provider that we want he wanted him we wanted him to look at that 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 um a contract you know um um you know anything that that we were uncomfortable with, that we felt we needed a level of, 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 of comfort or confidence or whatever, um, that he would, he would, he would certainly entertain that. And so, um, you know, we, I think we'll just think through some of these things and, and then get back together on, on, on what it is maybe we, we, we want to know more about. If there's not anything, specific. I mean, Barry just said he might have one or two things, um, you know, then we don't. But that's, you know, that's the direction I think that, that he suggested. So good deal. Okay. And com um, Commissioner Black, with, with, um, with the state auditor's permission, um, yeah. we recorded the conversation yesterday. Okay. Um, that way if any of the other commissioners would like to go back and listen to the conversation that was had between the parties, they can okay. do so. I'm going to just make sure it's transcribed. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I have no complaints. Uh, zero. Um, all right. So, um, Constance, was there anything that I, that I left out that, that stood out to you on that? No, I, I think you covered everything. The, the gist that I've got is that they, they, they didn't want to have us waste money and time to do 
they wanted you guys to be more specific as to what you were requesting yeah. and to avoid um, wasting resources of the agency. Yeah, I he. Think, I think we were just looking for an email. That's all. <laughs> you already confirmed it by uh, recording it, and the yeah. only thing we have to do now is transcribe it. We just we didn't want to be left hanging out there on the limb, so we're not on any limb anymore. No. Right, that's true. I mean, we 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 definitely said that we thought it would be responsible thing for us to do as a commission to to have the um, the agency audited, um, and we got you know we, we we talked through that with with him, and we got a I don't think it's it's necessary per se. If there's something you want it, you want to look at specifically, let me know. And that's what he he advised us on. And um, he also said that um, state agencies aren't often audited uh, in 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 a in this way in this manner. He said obviously the annual you know roundup of all of the agencies being audited occurs every year. Um, already with DDSN, and I forgot what that's called. What exactly is that called, Pat? The the, the term the CAFR, that, they call it, it's a CAFR. It's the statewide audit okay. report. It's okay, so one, this, one audit report for the entire state. Yeah. So he said, you know, we already get that every year, and he said that most agencies are not audited in the wet manner that we're asking um, as well. So because I specifically asked him, how often does this happen? Do you get this kind of request? You know, from um, you know, four, you know, eight, you know, specific agencies in South Carolina, and he said, "No, we do not typically." I mean, I'm, I'm, it's very rare. So, um, anyway, that's all I'll add on that. So we can move on if there's no other questions. On, um... I'm good. Okay. All right. So um, next item. Um, the last item, um, the CFO report, Pat. I got three quick bullets. Um, just for your information, uh, we paid $2.4 million to the provider network, uh, which was the 40%, that was the, uh, that was the 40% revenue loss that, that we're allowed to pay through Appendix K. And th those, those checks and, uh, band adjustments went out at the beginning of, um, April, correct? Or, yeah, okay. Um, the the national health emergency has been extended for 90 more days, and the impact on us is that we will now get 6.2 percent FMAP through October 31st of this year. It was it was going to end on June 30th, and that extra quarter is about 10 million dollars of FMAP. And my last bullet is um, we met with the human service providers today. And um, uh, w w which we meet every month with, and they were, um, you know, obviously the ten percent, the ten percent F map, that's thirty five or forty million dollars coming from uh, the federal government. They're getting itchy about like when's that coming and how are we going to divide it. And, and I gave them assurances that when the money comes, we're not going to spend it, and when we get guidance, we will let them know. And that uh, and I imagine you as commissioners will get pinged as well and so that's our communication to them is you know this is really geared toward the provider community and that certainly they're going to have a seat at the table before any recommendations get developed that go to the commission um and then the second thing was you know in the era of transparency when we talk about our finances and we talk about that you know our our cash balances for the end of the year and i'm estimating still 50 million plus or minus um uh uh, you know, they're like, well, well, well how much, you know, where, where, what are you gonna do with all that money? And, and, and so, you know, our, our communication is, you know, at least what I told them is, you know, it's, it's, uh, we've never been in that position since I've been here. So I don't know what I do with extra money, but it's just an asset of the agency to, 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 you know, serve our individuals and, and make sure the system's operating correctly. So all, all I'm saying to you guys is, there, there's an itch for priorities. There's an itch to uh, how are we going to spend some of this money, and um, just in case they they reach out and, and touch you, there's just a um, an interest in 
uh, in, in, in spending these funds. And and what I told, what I communicated to them was, uh, nobody's going to waste any money, and we're going to be diligent. And uh, um, and uh, as as we get more comfortable with the money we have, and we look at the options in front of us. Uh, I think uh, staff staff will have probably informal discussions with you guys, and if you are moving in a certain direction, we can develop proposals to address things. And uh, uh, I just want you to be aware of that sentiment that's out there in the provider community about the uh, the funds that are in our system and and how we're going to use them and to and to, uh, how we're going to prioritize them. So that's more of a statement than a than a, a, a question or, or asking for a response. That's all I have. All right. Let me just say that we, in that regard, he's exactly right. We do need to we do need to get a set of priorities, but one of those priorities needs to be capital improvements, and we have a lot of capital improvements to make, and those those are millions of dollars, and we we will never be in a better position to make those improvements than we are now. Yeah. Great. Sure. All right. Well, if no one else has anything else um our next meeting date is um june 1st which is a tuesday and we have um moved our finance and audit committee meeting to tuesdays at this time 3 p.m um and that will most likely be the case going forward for a while um tuesdays at three first tuesdays of, of the month at at three so um can i get a motion to adjourn Hello. second all right meetings adjourned thank you so much appreciate thank it you. it's 4 45. second tuesday you're gonna sign it right now or thank you.